Yeah, good morning, uh, everyone. I'm really glad to seeing you all again. Um, we had a great session yesterday. Um, and I think everyone is almost here. We're still waiting for Calypso, but we can uh, um, start with the informal part. I am really happy we're all here together again. We have um, uh, two new myths to discuss, um, which are prepared uh, both by Francesca Melandri and Mathieu Segers. And today we're actually doing the same thing uh, uh, as yesterday. Uh, we start with the mid, we have two people react to it, and of course also uh, the rest of the group is very much encouraged to, uh, to bring in their ideas and their reactions and any additional thoughts or, uh, or comments on this. Uh, the same counts for the uh, second myth of today. And finally, by the end of these two sessions, we hope to have uh, enough input uh, from all of you, enough ingredients for a new narrative um, uh, or new uh, new ideas about the idea of the European people um, uh, to, and, and ideas to improve Europe's uh, democracy. So uh, that's kind of the end goal of, uh, of today. And I'm really glad you're all here again. I'm not sure if Yuli still wants to add something or say something before we start with the introductions. Um. <clears throat> Well, no, not really. I think um, it was a wonderful, wonderful morning yesterday. I have a hell of a lot of um, um, notes taken on a lot of notes. I think um, <coughs> uh, it was a wonderful discussion. We touched on class struggle and nation state and empathy and freedom and personal freedom. <laughs> um, and maybe um, and on the crisis of, of democracy and represent representative democracy and, um, and the institutions of democracy. Um, we talked about um, the referenda, the Brexit example, and the Swiss example. <coughs> um, but I, I'm not going to um, summarize what we did yesterday. You were all there. Well, you were not all there. Um, um, because Alicia Gisinska is here uh, with us now. A uh, very warm well, welcome to you as well. Maybe it's good that we um, um, redo a very, very quick round um, of who we are. And maybe we start with Alicia. And uh, Vasil Kiripanim, who was here yesterday, is not today here because uh, he is launching a East Europe Biennial Alliance with the symposium today. So he can't be with us, but um, um, he said that it was very much in line with the things we are discussing here. So um, um, uh, that's maybe good to know. Um, let's redo the quick round of who is who. That's um, for the benefit of Alicia. And uh, maybe we can start with you, Alicia. Is that okay? That's definitely okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sorry I missed yesterday. Um, I'm happy to be with you today. Um, I'm a Polish-Belgian uh, philosopher and writer. I live in Belgium, uh, uh, but Poland and Polishness is still part of me. Um, and I'm also an academic. Um, I work at the University of Buckingham, where I lead PhD, a PhD program and an MA program. Um, and my areas of interest are uh, freedom and, of course, I'm very worried about uh, the state of democracy and the liberal uh, democracy in Europe. Uh, so I'm looking forward for uh, this, uh, this morning. Is that short enough, long enough? Great. Thank you so much. And, um, and I thought maybe it's nice for you as well, Alicia, if um, uh, during this uh, quick introduction round, which, we, which will be a bit shorter than yesterday maybe, um, but maybe there is something you really remember from the next session, what is important to know from Alicia, so she gets a bit of an insight oh, into you. what we discussed uh, yesterday. So if you can think of something that would be nice to include in your uh, uh, introduction. Uh, and Mathieu, can we start by you? Uh, my name is Mathieu Segers. I'm professor of contemporary European history um, and European integration at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. Um, I'm also um, publishing in Dutch media uh, as a columnist on European affairs, uh, and I greatly enjoyed our uh, exchange of ideas, uh, concepts, and, and, and questions and problems uh, of yesterday. Uh, and I thought it was uh, it was really great, a uh, really great way to uh, to kick off this uh, this conversation that we uh, hopefully can continue and also, yeah, can um, or, 
how shall I put it? Um, maybe maybe put in, in in writing as the as the goal of the of the whole session uh, was uh, was formulated by um, by Yuri. Um, I'm happy to uh, to contribute and looking forward to uh, the discussions and the exchange of ideas of today. Thank you so much, uh, Mathieu. Uh, Nicolo, can you quickly introduce yourself? Sure. Hello. Uh, I'm Nicolo Milanese. I'm director of European Alternatives, which is a civil society organization preparing for transnational democracy uh, for the past 15 years or so. And European Alternatives, if we're lucky, will host the next session of this council in Palermo. I uh, live in Paris. Um, I didn't mention that yesterday, but maybe it's, it's relevant. And I was born in London. So the Milanese part of my name is a kind of uh, mystery. From yesterday, I think that the um, one thing that's, that, that, that remains in my head and I think we can continue to think about is whether the European Union um, and European countries, but specifically the European Union, treats us as and conceives of us as citizens or more as consumers. And if it does treat us more like consumers, how happy are we about that and what might we do, what, what, what might we do to, to address it? So that's a theme that's, that's still in my mind. Thank you so much, uh, Nicolo. Um, Yuri, have you introduced yourself already? <laughs> Do, would you like to? Um, maybe you can put in your microphone so we can hear you. Um, my name is Yuri Albrecht. I'm the director of the Bali. Um, the Bali is one of the two partners in the Forum on European Culture, which we started about five years ago. I'm the curator of that and the artistic director of the Bali. Um, yes, and we, we're hoping to organize two more sessions of, like these, one in Palermo, indeed, and one in, um, in Warsaw. Um, what else can I say? Well, yesterday I thought it was a very, very encouraging discussion. I think I already mentioned what I, what I th thought of that, and I'm um, looking forward to today. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Anna? Uh, hello, I'm Anna galas uh, I'm a curator at Warsaw Biennial, Warszawa Biennale. Um, it's a public city institution, um, an institution that is running its uh, constant program and also organizing uh, every two year a kind of um, summary uh, in frame of a festival. Uh, and we are trying to um, touch and talk about uh, topics that are not present or not so much present in the mainstream Polish debate. And from yesterday, uh, I, would, I would refer to like two issues. Um, first is the, um, um, the thing that uh, Vassil actually was, uh, was mentioning. Uh, so the problem with the political centers uh, with uh, left basically that it's failed and the right that it's growing everywhere and especially in the central eastern countries and uh, but I but I do agree with him that this uh, problem with the center is also very important the center that is actually um, not present and also uh, wants to stay with this status quo uh, um, that um, using it as a, as a kind of resolution uh, and um, an issue about the European class war that actually we are facing and maybe it's even uh, much more important than, than um, the crisis of uh, EU itself. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anna. Um, uh, Francesca. Yeah, hello everyone. I am Francesca Melandri. I'm an Italian writer. Yeah, I've been a... on video. Am I on video? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah, yeah okay. See you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have been a screenwriter for television and movies for many years, and then since 10 years, I have published my first novel. I published three until now, and possibly regarding the topic of today, which my, my statement will be about, the most relevant is the first one, which is set in South Tyrol, which is a linguistic minority region, as you probably know. So um, that topic has always been very 
near to my heart. Uh, from yesterday, my, uh, I would like to underline something that I think Orlando said, which I think is really pivotal uh, when he was talking about the role of the media in the Brexit uh, referendum, and especially the BBC, uh, the um, false and neutrality of mainstream media in the rise of populism and uh, or anyway, their role their missed role as actually being vehicles of uh, factual information, but of uh, without taking responsibility, basically uh, giving a lot of uh, voice and platform to populistic um, fictions is very worrying to me. And for me, this is a very crucial point in the building of an informed uh, citizenship, of an informed uh, demos, as we were defining it yesterday, without knowing what is going, actually going on in the world, what the facts are, citizens can't make informed decisions. And that is very, very problematic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Francesca. Um, Orlando. Hello. Yes. Hello, everyone again. Um, I'm Orlando and I'm a historian. I've uh, written most of my books about Russia, but uh, recently on uh, a book called The Europeans, which is probably why I've been invited, which I'm very pleased about. And um, from yesterday, yeah, a number of things uh, struck me, I suppose. Um, the, the, uh, the institutional underpinnings of both democracy and citizenship were the, were the key uh, points of discussion, if I could summarize them, I suppose. I, I, I think, um, yeah, the, the, the question of um, how one way makes uh, citizenship more active uh, particularly in the young generation, uh, bothers me considerably. Um, but also, um, yes, uh, the, the uh, broadcast institutions, charters are, are not clearly set. Um, a number of other issues came up, but I, I'll shut up now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Flavia. Um, I'm in the same room with Orlando. I don't know if you can hear me still. Um, my name is Flavia Kleiner. I'm from Switzerland and I'm a political activist fighting right-wing populism. And what I keep from yesterday, and I also mention it because I think Geraldine Schwartz is not here yet. Um, we spoke also about um, citizens' education, civic education, and the importance of it maybe in, uh, regarding what it means citizen, to be a citizen and what Orlando just mentioned, how to engage young people in politics. That's also one thing I kept from yesterday. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Flavia. Uh, Simon. Yes, hi uh, again, um, I'm Simon. I'm uh, currently in Berlin and I'm um, working as a writer and a journalist and the co-founder of um, a cultural um, uh, oral history project called European Archive of Voices. And um, what I took from it, or better to say what I think we should uh, develop a little bit further is actually um, the two times mentioned media, uh, role of the media maybe, because I mean, it has been mentioned a couple of times now and me, I feel like representing a little bit at least the German mainstream media, if you want to say that. And I would be interested what you actually mean when you say the media has to give up its neutrality and to really engage into the political discourse or rather fight back right-wing populism and all of these things. I mean, this is really thrilling for me because I mean, I, you know, been brought up and learned that media has to be neutral and has to try not to engage into the political um, activism. But um, yeah, I'll be happy to discuss this and maybe we can come to these questions again. Thanks. Great, Simon. Thank you so much. Uh, Rika. Hi, I'm Rika kinga -Pop. Um, living in Budapest, working in Vienna as editor-in-chief of Eurozine, the online magazine. And uh, what, what stuck most with me from yesterday was mentioned by Flavia, the Swiss uh, approach of being in a union by choice and not by obligation. 
any sort of obligation or imposition, which is a, a pretty interesting thought for someone who has been um, socialized to think that that nationality or belonging is imposed on you and you have no choice about that. Imposed on you or you're excluded from it. That's like the two choices I was given and it's a very interesting proposition. Thank you so much, uh, Reka. Uh, then Calypso and Livia still, but we start with uh, Calypso. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, I mean, there's so many things that were said. Uh, let me just say two things. One is a building on what uh, Rika just said, uh, a union by choice. Um, that's that is the meaning of a union, right? We can all divorce, well, in most culture. Um, and so I would like to stress on this one that this is also the way in which uh, Brexit is a gift that keeps, gives on, keeps on giving and that we should value Brexit for that very reason, that it's a proof that, you, that the EU is a union by choice. Um, I call this in my book on Brexit, on, I mean, called Exodus, uh, I call this demonstrative sacrifice. It demonstrates something. So people don't really see Brexit in that light, but I think it's a useful light. And, um, and in terms of the many things that were said yesterday, I, I, I would pick up Orlando's uh, point that when, he, well, his question really, which I think is a sh really framing question, he, he asked, what is the agency that these myths serve? So, and, and therefore resistance to these myths. And I would say that our conversations uh, ought to be about, you know, how do we recover agency at the end of the day as citizens and in the many identities that we have? Um, and I would also pick Yuri's uh, point, uh, Yuri's not really nice phrase, two cheers for democracy, but three cheers for rule of law, because that's the frame within which we can recover agency. That's it. So I think uh, we continue. And, yeah, Livia. <laughs> yeah, hi everyone. I'm Livia. I'm from Germany. I'm a journalist with uh, the daily newspaper Frankfurt Allgemeine. And um, maybe just because uh, yesterday at the end I was interrupted, I will just say that uh, I, I talked about the myth uh, that the EU is anti-democratic and uh, has a regulation spleen and um, explaining why regulations are actually also important and good for us and protect us um, and save um, or strengthen our rights. And then there was some uh, criticism um, saying, well, maybe this is part of the problem that the EU is mainly perceived as a regulation machine and not, um, uh, not famous for its values um, and the really important things that bind us together. And uh, with this, I would definitely agree. And uh, also maybe um, come to, to the role, the important role that journalists play in this um, to, on the one hand, surely um, say or yeah, tackle these myths and um, talk more objectively about regulations um, and not with this sort of panic that you can sometimes find in the media um, about the bureaucrats of Brussels, but on the, on the other hand, also bring in new topics and make um, strengthen other um, yeah, other fields that are important for us. All right, thank you so much, everyone. I think this is also really helpful because we now get a sense of a commonality or, or the points that are shared by, uh, uh, by some of you or a lot of you. So I think this is a really a good start and really interesting. Um, but then I would like to start with the first uh, contribution of today, uh, which is prepared by uh, Francesca Melandri. Um, so, Francesca, I would like to, uh, to give the floor to you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just a warning, uh, I don't know if you have noticed, but sometimes my Zoom crashes. This has been happening yesterday and it has already happened once this morning. So if you see me disappear, <laughs> I'm sorry and I have no idea why, but I will try to come back. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay. So uh, the myth uh, I would like to talk about today is the myth of monolingual national identities. 
uh, just a premise after yesterday's very ideal, very high discussion, I will talk to you about something very practical and uh, which is something we all do in our lives, which is mm, speaking, talking. And so we'll speak about language. So the premise and the, the myth, the false myth, in my opinion, is uh, of nationalistic ideals, is that there is this, this myth of linguistic homo homogeneity. Uh, and it's a false myth um, because, uh, uh, first of all, linguistic diversity within each present day European country is the norm. There are very few, if any, uh, European nation states, which include only one language. And this, without even mentioning the languages of the new, Euro new Europeans, which they're bringing to the table, nor the dialects. And on the other hand, most European languages are spoken also by communities outside the national borders of their namesake countries. So uh, what this means is that the national borders and the linguistic borders of each language almost never coincide. I put an almost to be on the careful side, but I would say never coincide. Europe is linguistically very rich. There are 60 languages and language has historically been a source of political tension and sometimes oppression. But in my opinion, the answer is not to create even smaller nation states where the purity of minority languages is protected and implemented. And as I mentioned in the, in the introduction, my experience of having lived and having raised a family in South Tyrol has really given me a lot of uh, experience of what it is uh, to handle this this topic in in real life and in real politics. Um, in the micro, in this micro nationalistic model, where linguistic minorities they often become oppressive linguistic majorities in their own regions and repeat on a smaller scale, like a fractal scale, the linguistic bullying that they themselves suffered by the central state in past history. The splitting of former Yugoslavia is probably the most tragic example. Of course, it wasn't only a linguistic issue, but also. Um, so for me, the solution uh, is not creating more, as we say in Italian, piccole patrie, more homelands. Mm, by the way, the myth of monolingualism is also false for them because there's always someone else who speaks the other language. And a federal Europe, which implements multilingualism everywhere, is for me the only way to protect this linguistic diversity without it becoming the reason for even more stifling and smaller micro-nationalism. Neuroscientific findings are uncontested. Bi or plurilingual small children have cognitive advantages over monolingual children in their brain development. They find not only, obviously, they find learning further languages much easier, but also they're, they're able to see reality from different viewpoints without considering them irrevocably antagonistic. And this is a shout out to you, Nicolò, the capacity to think more in terms of both and rather than either or, like Keats uh, defined the negative capability you, you quoted yesterday. And uh, they're also more able, therefore, to change their minds when presented with convincing evidence. Also, speaking a language which is not your first language makes you more existentially courageous. Maybe you don't speak perfectly, but you do it anyway. You, you dare doing it. So the bottom line is that plurilingualism gives children exactly the education and the qualities the citizens of a mature democracy should have. The magic age for learning uh, second, la second, third, fourth languages is uh, zero to 10. After 10, it very quickly decreases and quickly becomes like that of adults. So this is why, in my opinion, multilingual public free Kindergarten and elementary schools for all European children should be a priority in the creation of the future EU. It's really strategic, I think. And it's not utopia. It's already been done since decades in South Tyrol, in the kindergarten and, uh, and elementary schools of the Ladin Valleys. Children, since they are three, are taught in three languages, Italian, German, and Ladin. And then very quickly, I don't know exactly what um, class, in elementary school, the fourth language, English, is added on and nobody complains. Um, extra European languages spoken by the new Europeans, quote unquote, should be also valued and taught, especially where there are big communities and considered a part of European culture, exactly like their native speakers are to be considered part of European society. Uh, there is this idea that multilingualism is elitist, uh, which uh, um, it, it's like a sandwich because there are the elites, the, the bourgeois people who can send their children 
abroad to study languages, but on the other hand, there are immigrants who all of them speak at least, or most of them speak at least two languages. So it's, it's, it's a myth, this too is a myth. I would uh, allow me here to just make, make a small note. I know this has already been said, but as we're talking of new, new Europeans, I must express the fact that I'm very uncomfortable at the fact that in this forum, we're all absolutely white. And uh, I feel this is a missed opportunity of bringing more voices, more languages, more viewpoints, uh, to the table, and um, I really can't help but saying it because for me this is very important. And uh, bracket. Um, English is, of course, the world's lingua franca, and it is Europe's too. We are speaking in English now, and uh, for uh, almost none except Orlando, I think it's our. Uh, first language, so and this is this is wonderful, and it's wonderful that this la lingua franca exists. It's a resource, uh, and so it should be kept on seeing. Um, on the other hand, oh, no, it's not on the other hand. And um, there is this imbalance between Western and Eastern European languages, and. I'm the first one to be at fault in this. Uh, many Eastern Europeans speak at least one Western European language, which is not the case, which is not the uh, case of the reverse. <laughs> there is, of course, there are many reasons for this um, cultural hegemony. Uh, you all know them, I don't need to explain to them, geopolitical, historical, and so on, of the, uh, the uh, cultural, therefore linguistic hegemony of the West towards the East. And I personally don't have solution nor proposals on how to address this, but I think it should be addressed and acknowledged in uh, thinking about a, a more united Europe. Uh, another point, the Erasmus program. It's very hyped by the media storytelling. My hunch is that that's because the media people are the kind of people who can afford to send their children to Erasmus programs. It's not a program uh, for everyone because it's too expensive. The, um, the grants which are given with the Erasmus um, scholarships are very, very little. They're absolutely not enough to live abroad. So this has uh, an obvious selection of the families who can send their kids, uh, in, in, in how much they are uh, capable of affording it as families. And this is not fair, this is not just. Now, I. I try to find out the, the um, exact percentage. I didn't, and I apologize, but I know it's in the single, low single digit, the percentage of young who in these 20 years since the Erasmus program um, was implemented actually used it. This is really too low. Uh, and uh, this class um, element, I think, has been really detrimental. So uh, if the Erasmus program has to go on, which in itself is a wonderful idea. I think it should be really being given a lot of more money so that grants are given to students who uh, do not come from families who can just, you know, take it out from their pockets. Also, um, the selection of uh, making the young people of Europe know each other and go abroad only for the upper education uh, young, that's already a selection of class in itself most of the time. Um, so why not uh, make it a point of have the youth of Europe meet each other also if they don't go to the university? Workers, young workers. Uh, here I put a very, you can say, partially naive list of, of, of uh, trades, plumbers, hoteliers, artisans, mechanics, farmers. That's not the point. But anyway, even the working young, why couldn't they be uh, given the opportunity to go and switch experiences and learn languages in the meantime? with their peers uh, all over Europe. And, and an interesting experience has been made by the German government who has implemented something of the kind exactly for uh, this kind of demographic, but it wasn't a great success. Some went, but very few applied. And this is an interesting catch. Um, uh, and that is because um, they were monolinguals and uh, they, they felt shy at the idea of going, they, they, they didn't feel up to the, to the task of going abroad and not speaking the language yet, which of course is, you know, it's a catch 22. The less you travel, the less you speak languages. And if the less you speak languages, the less you travel. It's, it's like a, yeah, it's like a catch 22 of enclosure in your own 
linguistic and cultural I think we lost um, Francesca. Um, maybe we can wait. Probably she will just click the link and uh, she will get back to us um, and finish this, her statement. So let's just wait for a second. Yeah, this is exactly what I meant. I'm sorry about that. No worries. Uh, you were speaking about the catch-22 of not speaking yeah, a yeah. language, not being able to, or yeah. being shy to travel. So, exactly. So again, this means that um, giving a multilingual education from very, from the very uh, first um, public, and I stress public, it, it, it shouldn't be for, you know, people who can send their kids to, to international schools. As, as a normal part and uh, fundamental and strategic part of the European schools curriculum, this is really important. Uh, European media. Um, my kids uh, learned English watching, <laughs> uh, streaming online, the American uh, and, and, and British TV series. So watching uh, foreign televisions is a, main, is a very wonderful way of learning languages and learning culture and getting to know each other. I would dream of uh, uh, the equivalence of the roaming law, you know, the, the fact that now with our cell phone, we can, we can call all over Europe with the same uh, tariffs we pay in our own country for uh, television, for, uh, for national broadcasters. It would be great if I from Italy could be able to watch not just BBC and ZDF, but also Hungarian television and uh, Polish television and Portuguese television and vice versa. This would be, in my opinion, a very good way of, again, getting to know each other and also listening to each other's languages. Um, then, I am a writer. I write novels. So, of course, uh, I give a lot of importance to the role of literary translation in the publishing industry. As of today, the publishing industry and its distribution is enclosed within the national borders and even the, the national multinational publishing conglomerates don't reason and don't market in terms of Europe. They are within the national borders. And also, and this is something maybe we can operate more than private enterprises, um, today, uh, the grants and the funds for translations are based on a national um, idea. So they work like, like this. Either the EU gives money to publishers of smaller countries so that they can afford to translate in their own languages books by foreign authors. Uh, like my publisher in Croatia always uses these funds. Or on the other hand, countries uh, subsidize, subsidize the translation of their own writers in foreign languages, like in, in Holland you have the Letteren funds which does this. What do, I, what do I want to say with this? If this were an interpersonal relationship, you would say that European countries put their money, their own money, therefore they're giving more value into talking rather than into listening. And this, I think, should change because allowing all Europeans to be exposed to the culture produced in all of Europe should be, again, a strategic goal. So I would uh, uh, support incentives to translations in both directions and sovereignational thought in a sovereign, not left to the nations, not left to the individual languages, but again, uh, thinking of the uh, dissemination of uh, European culture, in this case, uh, literature and, and languages and ideas as strategic to the buildup of uh, a European citizenship. Uh, so this means that translators are pivotal and they must be regarded as really strategic facilitators of a more uni united Europe and so they should be well paid and qualified. Then I have been at the end, of, I'll just throw in some more ideas, maybe a little randomly, but um, I'll just, you know, throw them out to you. Uh, again, as a writer, um, I am tired of these big literature festivals in big city theaters and flashy venues. By the way, all my colleagues, my fellow writers, we all share and we have, many of us have talked about it, how 
um, the public is often really not diverse uh, and uh, this is disheartening. Uh, they are a vastly older middle class white audiences. Of course, I have nothing against uh, uh, older middle class white people, but I would like it not to be the only demographic which is uh, involved in the creation of uh, European culture. So what to do about that? Again, I don't have answers, but um, I definitely think that the literary circus should go more towards uh, the marginal, towards the not so central. And um, the pandemic, one of the good things of the pandemic, and again, here we are demonstrating that it's actually something that can be done, uh, has been in showing that people don't need to be physically together to have a very interesting discussion like the one we're having now. So in this respect, this could be a tool that could be used to bring readers in less central places. And by less central, I don't mean only um, geographically less central, but in schools, in prisons, in, in uh, public library, libraries, in book clubs of, again, not the big capitals or not only the big capitals. And uh, again, making uh, the, the sharing of European culture something that is done really at the citizens level, not at the um, elite level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Very to conclude, again, just throw out uh, European book distribu distribution yeah. networks, fundings to national public libraries on the condition of the presence of books in other languages, broad in school curricula, uh, studying other literatures is very important. Uh, there are other worldviews, other experiences, other historical um, thoughts. Uh, European sub subsidies to independent bookstores. This seems marginal, but it's actually very important as any person who has anything to do with books will tell you independent bookstores really are the keepers of the quality of the market. And so to be united in continental networks, and um, thank you so much. These are really a lot, a lot of ideas, yes. Francesca. Thank you so, so much. And uh, just the bottom line is a more united and democratic Europe needs to be multilingual and multicultural. I agree. Think. Thank you very much. Uh, Orlando, I saw you raising your hand a few times, and Livia, I saw you as well. So we will uh, get back to you, but starting with Orlando. Uh, yes, from excitement. So, um, that was fantastic, um, Francesca. Um, and I, you said something that really fascinated me fairly early on. You said that um, uh, studies showed that in terms of cognition and confidence, young people who were able to take on a foreign language, um, they f you know, there was difference in confidence in confidence. I can't remember your exact wording, but you'll, you'll probably recall. What yeah, I wrote, it, I wrote it down because I also <laughs> found it really interesting. Speaking more languages makes you more existential courageous, what, was what yeah, you said. Exactly. You uh, dare speaking not very well. You, you, you dare being not perfect. Basically. Okay, so you're now going to get me on my other obsession. Yesterday I was obsessed by Brexit. Today I'm obsessed <laughs> by, by, by how bad the English are at languages. And I wonder whether there's a correlation between the two. Mm. Because, uh, you know, a lot of studies were done after the referendum. You know, was it the disenfranchised? Was it the provinces against the metropolitan elites? Was it those with the university education and those without? I suspect that um, one dimension of this is that those who um, don't, because I mean, everyone's traveled more, but there are, believe me, Brits who go to Spain and complain that there are too many Spaniards there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so also the question of imagination, uh, the ability to em empathize with, with other cultures. And I wonder whether that's a function of the, this, this growing enclosure that you mentioned. I think that was your word you know, um, the island mentality of the Brits, I think has probably something to do with language. And that if you probably could uh, find quite um, a, a, a significant correlation between the metropolitan elites, believe me, they don't actually speak as many languages as they ought to, mm -hmm. um, uh, but, they, but they will at least make an effort to speak Italian in, in Italy, French in France uh, before giving up politely whereas um those who, who who don't have that confidence perhaps have found the cosmopolitanism with which we've all been living 
in the last generation, they find it quite intimidating. They find it quite alien. And, and that's maybe because th this linguistic barrier inhibits them and makes them hunt out of fear or out of alienation for the familiar. So I find, I think that's really interesting. I'd, I'd love to know across Europe what, whether there are similar divides in societies between those who are, who are confident about taking on other languages. I suppose in most places it would be English. Um, and those that feel that they're excluded from this. And, and if they are these correlations, that seems to me a really rich and interesting way forward to activate young citizens. Um, because if, if, if there is you know, greater concentration to integrating people politically as citizens, and the, the, the medium for that is the facility to communicate in English, that's great. But mm -hmm. that of course then leaves behind the other issue of, of you know, what do you do about all the other 59 languages spoken in Europe? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that is, is a genuine problem, especially, um, you know, given, uh, I had a very interesting discussion yesterday in this very room I am now with cultural practitioners across Europe and, uh, you know, having to use post COVID more internet, uh, platforms um, to, to make it commercially viable to have artistic productions and so on. Um, but then that's going to be, you know, what's going to happen to Flemish theatre? What's going to happen, dare I even ask, to sort of German theatre? Because it's not a big enough audience if you use those platforms. But that, that's a minor point. What I found really interesting was what your, your comment about um, existential confidence and what that can mean for European citizenship. Yeah, thank you so much. I saw a lot of hands uh, while you were talking, uh, Orlando, so I'm trying to... Um, I saw Livia, Alicia, Yuri and Anna, and I wanted to start with uh, uh, Livia. Yes, uh, thank you. It was a really interesting um, your presentation and especially that you didn't only describe the problems but made so many proposals for improvement and I just want to um, comment on one aspect uh, that you mentioned which is the European media because I think it's really so crucial if we want to unite this continent to have a common public space and I really don't understand why we still didn't achieve to have something like that because as you said on Netflix languages are no barrier and no problem for anyone so uh, why not have the European channel other than Euro news which is really like not uh, seen by anyone um, and uh, you talked about the, the cultural programs and uh, and fiction which I think would be very important but also from my perspective as a politics journalist of course I would love to have um, talk shows or like political programs with um, European politicians and not only the, the German politicians um, explaining uh, the EU to us, but also have um, hear them from other countries. Um, while instead, if I look at my newspaper, for example, um, the Brussels correspondents thing, and um, in Brussels, I think in the past year, so many correspondents left Brussels because of economy because the media, all the media is a matter of priority. I mean, if we have a whole office in Berlin, the capital, why not have this in Brussels as well? And I think um, this would be also very important as we talk about myths here to, to break up national myths about the EU, which exists as well. Um, I think every nation has, has its own myth, for example, for Germany. I think this is the really absurd myth that um, Germany always thinks it's like the perfect <laughs> EU member, right? <laughs> And uh, they're ungrateful, they don't see what kind of a great thing the EU is. Why do the Poles abolish their constitutional state? Um, why, uh, you know, why do we pay so much? Um, and all of these uh, things are not true, actually, if you, if you look at the numbers and you see that um, uh, Germany had so many um, lawsuits of, uh, for breach of contracts, actually, uh, more than Poland or Hungary and um, and it's just uh, nobody tells us this because we don't hear, you know, politicians from other other member yeah. states uh, saying this. And the same with uh, same with finances. I mean, uh, per capita, uh, Germany is definitely not number one, but uh, I think France and Belgium are. So, I yeah, think international or like a European news channel would be good for that. 
Yeah, great, great suggestion. Thank you so much, Livia. Um, Alicia, do, did you want to add something to this point uh, that Francesca made about multilingual, um, uh, uh, a multilingual Europe? Yes, thank you very much, and thank you for this uh, wonderful talk and all the responses so far. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of things because I live in Belgium, which is a country with three official languages, French, Dutch, and uh, German. And um, um, you could think that we are quite cosmopolitan and that Belgians are uh, citizens of the world. Well, well that's not the case. Um, the far right is very popular here. Um, the NVA is a Flemish party that really um, tries to, to attract voters just to the Flemish, on the Flemish language and the Flemish tradition, whatever that might be. Um, and they are very, very popular. So it's not because you speak a lot of languages um, that you are, have an open geist or an open worldview necessarily. So we have to be careful not to create a new myth or to become too hopeful that if when you speak three, four languages, uh, you immediately are opening uh, to the world. You can still be very focused on... Yeah, um, I'm, I think this is a really interesting point, Alicia, and I'm also curious to hear maybe from the others as well, and Alicia, from you as well, like what what is it then that, that makes, um, uh, makes you more flexible or more courageous if you speak several languages? Well, um, I, and I wish I knew the answer to that. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that I raise my children three-lingually. So we speak Polish, uh, English, and uh, Dutch at home and it's not it's possible uh, so it's not that 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 uh, life in Belgium makes something like that impossible but actually it is on, on not on a political level but on a citizen level or on the level of, of, of other yeah um, Belgians and Flemish people around me that there is still a quite of negative view people sometimes tell me that I'm harming my children I'm harming my children by raising them trilingually. So there is a lot of work to do if we really want to um, explain to people why languages are important. Um, well, it, I just want to say, say it's more difficult. It's not just the fault of the politicians or of a, a certain type of elite that we don't speak so many languages. People are afraid of it in a way. This is what my experience shows me. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I wanted to add. Uh, we. It, it, I don't think it's an immediate solution to that we will speak more languages and we will have open hearts and open minds. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't like to look down on the English people because they speak one language only. I don't think there is a correlation with Brexit, if, um, if you would ask me. Um, I think there is, are other reasons why people that speak English or French are not learning other languages and that's because all the other rest is learning their language and they are they they benefit from it but they are also victims of it mm -hmm. um and that's where this inequality um mm -hmm. well and i want to hear I saw a few hands, but I was wondering, Mathieu, you also write a lot about the concept of Verstehen, right? So I was wondering, would you like to react to specific to this point or? Yes, very briefly. I raised it yesterday, the point of Verstehen, but in another context. But of course, it's, it's, it's most obvious in the art of translation. And I fully uh, feel with uh, Francesca the importance of, of, of learning languages and through that also exercising this essential uh, skill of Verstehen. That is one of the ways to do it. But uh, living myself and coming from a three-lingual uh, region, uh, German, French uh, and Dutch, uh, Maastricht is in, a, in this new region, uh, a region which is new, now confronted the last 20 years with a fourth language next to the local dialect, which was the official fourth language, so to say, namely English, is experiencing English, this lingua franca, as a centrifugal force, a force that is separating uh, a very, very vehemently, actually, local communities. And I think that is also, this is this great paradox between, on the one hand, the ambition of Verstehen, but on the other hand, the practice of live and let live. So, or put it maybe even more crudely, um, integration 
is something that is hated in a region like my region because this, these, of these micro cultures with their own languages. They don't want to integrate. History learns them that integration is not the way to go. The way to go is live and let live. It's not about integration, so to say, but more about forgiveness or something like that, or um, let the other be the other without really understanding what he or she is or wants to be or aspires. And I think this is, this, this is a, a paradox that, that, that fascinates me and really very close to the remarks that uh, Alicia also made. Um, uh, it, it, there is no solution here. So what we can learn from European history uh, is that um, live and let live um, is often the more pragmatic and working route um, than you know, ambitions for integration or uh, getting more, more to, together. And then one, one final remark that I always find very striking in this context is uh, this, this example of Ivan Krastev, this Bulgarian political scientist. He says Bulgarians are against the European Commission because they fear that within 40 or 50 years, nobody will be able to read Bulgarian poetry anymore. And this is the great centrifugal force of English and the English of you know, the, the market, so to say, that is kind of tearing Europe apart. These Bulgarians are also very afraid, and that, that is very close to my heart because I'm somebody who was ra raised uh, in the local dialect. They're also very afraid that uh, the grandfather uh, uh, and mother of their grandchildren cannot speak to their grandchildren in their natural language anymore. And here it's only about dialect, you must say. But in Bulgaria, it is about the Bulgarian language. A lot of Bulgarians already used the internal market to go away and work somewhere else. They married across the border. Now they speak German or English in their marriage. And their children are unable to speak Bulgarian anymore to their grandparents uh, at the per periphery of the internal market. This is a fascinating paradox that in many ways, and it relates very much to the points made by uh, Francesca, in many ways is at the heart of the matter and the problems of, of European integration. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mathieu. Really interesting point. Um, I saw Anna, Yuri, Nicola, and then we also go to the persons who really prepared something in reaction to this statement, uh, uh, Reka and then uh, Calypso. But we start with Anna. Thank you very much. Uh, I will just uh, start with uh, some thoughts about the Erasmus program that was mentioned, uh, because I think that this is really this economic barrier uh, that this program has, even if it's really great, it's something, um, it's something that uh, it's important to, um, to talk about. Uh, I checked fast that only 133,000 of young Polish people benefited from this program during all these years. And it's really a, a, a really small amount of thinking about, you know, all, all students that could have this possibility to go somewhere abroad. Um, and I think that it's a problem of redistribution, economic redistribution of the goods that Europe has. And it's a question how we distribute it and how we invest it in the young generation. And how we help people to exchange and to know each other better. Uh, but I think that this economic problem is um, it's, it's really crucial. And uh, commenting on uh, multilingualism and the idea, um, I think that, or being a young mother, I have to say that the idea to have a free European kindergartens uh, where there will be a possibility to learn more languages is absolutely my favorite, uh, <laughs> my favorite idea. But Talking seriously, uh, I um, and explaining yesterday, Gerardine actually finished our talk um, uh, mentioning these differences or understandings and misunderstanding between Western and Eastern countries. I will just refer to the Polish experience because 
often foreigners that are coming to Poland, they are shocked that so many Polish people just speak um, foreign languages. And this, this has got actually its historical issue because during the communists where, um, uh, when, when our country was closed and we were, we, people couldn't travel, actually after 89, many parents uh, invested a lot of money uh, to make their children speak languages. So we have actually a young generation and young people um, that were uh, educated after, after this fall down of communists, that they, are, um, they, they know many languages. Uh, but of course, on the other hand, um, uh, this doesn't help to have this division in the society uh, of being very homogeneous and during last years of being afraid so much of immigrants. Uh, so I see also this kind of tension that on the one hand we have many people like knowing languages and being very open wanted to travel and on the other hand we have people that are very closed. Uh, they don't want um, uh, foreigners or immigrants coming coming to, to the country. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. oh, and and just last quote about the media uh, and this idea of uh, European media um, with, with, with possible connection to all the countries. Uh, we are actually facing from 2015 how the public media were taken over by, uh, by uh, right wing. And actually, right now, it's only a propaganda. So you cannot, um, you cannot find there like real, uh, uh, real, real news or um, something that it's, let's say, uh, neutral, as it was mentioned at the chat by Simon. And I'm just, I'm just talking about it just to um, tell you that there is, again, this risk, this tension. Uh, who, who's going to control it? I mean, what kind of news? Because uh, today we are living in a very media world, but it's also a question like what kind of news, what we present to the people. And that's all, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anna. Yuri, I saw you also raising your hand. Um, Did you yeah. still want to get back to something? <laughs> um, Some time ago, sorry. No, don't worry. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting conversation. I think uh, I agree with Mathieu, and uh, thank you very much, Francesca, for the interesting introduction. Um, it's interesting that you lived in the, in the southern Tyrol, in the Zutirol. Um, I'd done my DPhil in Oxford as, on uh, national minorities, and I studied the South Tyrol case you know, extensively. I mean, it's an interesting case, and it's, um, I agree with Mathieu that it goes to the heart of the European problem, um, this multilingual issue. Um, it's both, um, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, ripping us apart, um, uh, the, the sort of the, the, the English of uh, every, everybody using the one language thing, so translation and keeping minorities uh, and minority lang 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 languages uh, alive and, and paying for translation, like Francesca Melandri said, are essential to, I think, the union project. But I have to um, disappoint maybe um, Orlando Figes. Um, um, multilingualism is not, uh, and I agree uh, uh, with Alicia, it's, it's not a, um, um, it will not help you against um, uh, voting for Brexit or, or petty, petty nationalism. It even sometimes helps it. It's more complicated than that. Um, I raised my children. I'm married, married to an Italian. I raised my children in uh, German because of their, grand, their, their grandparents, in Dutch because they live in Holland, and in Italian to speak to the other grandparents. And it doesn't, uh, that as such is, um, I've done a lot of studies on multilingualism, and it helps your structure uh, psycholinguists have done a lot of research on this. It helps the structure of your brain to do more languages. It doesn't necessarily make you more, uh, 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 have more empathy towards others. Um, that, comes from, that comes from a different kind of education. So it develops the network of your brain in a psycholinguistical sense, but not the empathy in it. <laughs> so um, that has to come from what we discussed yesterday, also from education and learning empathy. <laughs> which is a different thing than multilingualism. But the fear of smaller languages to die is really, really, is really, really 
strong force like Krustov described for the Bulgarians, but you can see it in, in any part of Europe. So it's, um, if the project of Europe is going to, uh, to, to succeed, the riddle, ri the, the riddle of one language and multi-languages and is, is, is really crucial to its to, to success. And it's not by just granting minority rights, because rightly what Francesca said, a lot of them will just be um, going from oppressed minority to oppressing majority, like the Catalans or the South Tyrol or the Flemish. Or the, so, so it's strangely enough, um, uh, granting more and more smaller languages, uh, small nation rights is not a solution, but, the, but, but denying them the right and the possibility to express themselves in their language is also dangerous. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's difficult. It's very complicated. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Reka, you also prepared something. Would you like to give your reaction to uh, Francesca's statement? Yeah. So a small disclaimer. The thing is, there's too many children in this household and I send them all away. They're being homeschooled. But my parents just appeared unannounced from the very other side of the country. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I was expecting them, but for the afternoon. So now they're all going on. Bringing all the pickled jars and everything, which is uh, which is a part of my of my argumentation. Just you know, these are the people who raised me without a dialect, um, speaking my mother tongue without the dialect that I speak uh, that I understand from my grandparents, and I have a hard time digging it up. But these are also the people who who raised me with a competence for empathy and who are learning English at the age of sixty five now with all sorts of software that they got their hands on recently. And I'm a person who didn't take an Erasmus because I wouldn't have been able to uh, make ends meet because it's very hard to send these things by post uh, or it used to be pretty hard to send these things by post. Now there's all sorts of services which, which take these like moving routes from Eastern Europe towards Western and Northern Europe and bring all your stuff with them and they're you know not regular shipping companies but basically like emigre companies. It's a very weird service. We use it a lot. But anyway, back to the point. I want to add a few things about the lingua franca itself. My mother's here. She's bringing a huge envelope. It's very weird, very suspicious. <laughs> so, um, as an ed and I'm going to more or less read it so that I don't ramble that much. So it's not that long. Uh, but I'll try to, you know speak more freely. So as an editor of a magazine which publishes primarily in English, I experience language barriers every day. And many authors even tend to shy away from writing because, or potential authors, because they don't think their English is good enough. They feel like they have to make, make excuses for not using like, a, you know, an Ox, Oxford style guide uh, level of English. And they wouldn't even dare to ask to be translated from their mother tongues because they feel obliged. They feel like they should be able to write easily and at the same quality in English. Um, and when negotiating or at meetings, I also sense that people with less apparent like national or regional accents and especially less audible Eastern accents tend to gain more traction. They, they are just credited more. And of course, you all know this, but dialects within your own respective languages, and I guess you all know this even from your experiences with speaking English too. And in the editor, editing process, it's almost natural, I have discovered, um, to allow for certain German expressions to be used in English language texts of philosophy or social theory, simply because German is considered the language of logos. But this hardly applies to other languages, uh, peculiar terms. And native language editors, native English, langu uh, and English language editors, um, will often pluck out idioms, fordulatok in Hungarian, that is, as the language turns, typical of other languages, and replace them with their own vernacular, creating texts with, which resemble little of the author's personality or mindset. And this is done all in good faith. And I'm very thankful that I don't have to accuse my colleagues at Eurozine of this because they themselves are literary translators too. And they have experience with, um, with this sort of uh, replacement of a certain vernacular or replacement of a character of language. Uh, but I have had this, this experience oftentimes uh, with other editors. 
Um, and I guess we're all guilty of this a little. So I'm really against this. And I, it, it's not only because I am in, in that kind of sense, you know, slightly disadvantaged too, um, because this is not my native language. And I, I oftentimes struggle expressing myself and I have a, a strong mimicry uh, Cartoon Network based American uh, pronunciation, but that doesn't mean that this comes naturally to me. Um, the point of the text and an argument, I think, is strongly nuanced by the language choices of those who made them. And the literary quality of the text adds heaps, heaps to its character, not to even mention its persuasive power, the color and the layers within the text. And even when it comes to the most scholarly ones, I think it's a very important um, part of any argumentation. And there's also a certain built-in arrogance that comes with the lingua franca, which Hungarians again call a word, a word tonk, where it's, uh, which its non-native users must not give into. I argue very strongly that we must not give into this sort of uh, ideal of the perfect English that we have to imitate. Languages which make it to this pedestal of being a lingua franca are there not for some kind of unique merit or out of some kind of natural truth, which you also know is not really an existing thing, but because of political advantages, which so far in human history have always been closely tied with slaughter, exploitation, and oppression, so there's nothing to be proud of there. These languages are more often than not forced onto others, conquered or colonized others, who suffer structural disadvantages also through the compulsory use of a second language, being read as less intelligent or capable than native speakers when they show the signs of speaking a second language. I'm not talking about us in this case, but I'm talking about, you know, the British Empire forcing itself or imposing itself on a good part of the world. There are, of course, others. Now I'm talking about ourselves, presumably, who are here in this panel. And... Uh, yeah, of course, we're all white. That should be acknowledged. I also know that De Bali makes a conscious effort to avoid these situations, and I'm pretty sure that they have been mindful about this. Um, so I'm not put, putting out the blame game. Don't worry. So there are, of course, others who need to master languages as a result of only cultural colonization. And I wouldn't dare to compare these two situations. However, I do argue that in both of these cases, the users who find themselves having to speak a language more dominant than theirs should hold on to their own vernacular, insist on their own mindset and the expression that, uh, that mediated. In fact, we should mirror translate into English more often than we dare to do and lend forms to the language we use uh, as much as possible because it both enriches the given language that we're using and it allows its users, that is all of us, to better inhabit it. Local versions, even when they are not inherent dialects or accents typical of certain nationals, for instance, are a part of this language now. They are not some externalia, they're not mistakes, they're not failures, they're part of English, which is as layered as are the people who use it, and nobody owns this language above everyone else, and we should hold on to this. The editing process this way, from, for us at least, becomes a balancing game, seeking a middle ground between the host language's grammatical and idiomatic correctness, the author's cultural character, uh, characteristics and their personal traits as speakers and writers, and of course the ever imposing matter of readability because, you know, ideally somebody should also be able to understand what is being said there very refinedly. Um, so after all, I would argue that whoever you colonize, martially or culturally, will have their own effect on you and they are entitled to that effect. We have to hold on to this. At Eurasia, we publish primarily in English, but we also publish other language versions along the English text. Um, and we really cherish this opportunity. We have a network of European journals contributing to us in their own languages, which we translate and support their own translations into several languages. Uh, because however proficient one may be in a foreign tongue, reading in your own is always a different experience, also a different energy level that you have to bet there, and finds you at a closer spot. These versions also allow for a type of critical reading, which is extremely valuable, especially when it comes to texts about com complex concepts, when one speaks little Lithuanian, 
and wants to compare the passage with the Turkish translation, there's a very, very big added value there if they are, uh, if they can make this transition between languages and better understand the concept, which, you know, concepts we are still only circumscribing. Most of the expressions that we have are only trying to get closer, the, the closer to the concept that we have in our heads, but are not like exclusively expressive of them. And this is an important trait. Mm -hmm. I cannot but wholeheartedly agree that the European public sphere has to be multilingual, even if it is impossible to translate every, every bit of content into every language yet. Although at Eurozine we aim at a general public, a shared public sphere has to be a robust ecosystem of players of very different sizes and volumes who overlap and engage with each other in a huge discourse and not in a uniform way. Smaller pockets of public spheres are always more intimate and may generate much deeper and very peculiar discussions and have to feed back into the broader conversations, avoiding any designated center or a compulsory perspective. Mm -hmm. Today, there is no pan-European discourse of this magnitude. And some of us are trying to do this also in multilingual ways. And some of us, some media are functioning as, as pan-European, but they have their own very strong perspectives or are talking from a designated center, which I would set out to criticize. And this sort of, of um, European a, a level media sphere has to be set up at last and not only about institutional news. The existing media sphere is obviously dominated, dominated by Anglo-Saxon perspectives and of course, institutional news from Brussels, but that's just, you know, office politics that is dominating news anyway, which has already been a problem in national media spheres anyway. Finland, Serbia and Cyprus are no res less relevant than England, culturally or politically, especially when it comes to say, international corruption, which tends to happen between countries, regardless of borders, as, it, as we've seen this from international investigative reporting too. And maybe it's time the English started to learn about the world their ancestors set out to conquer. And then, you know, I said, yeah, it's, it's the English, hashtag not all Brits. And Orlando will definitely have something much more nuanced to add here. We can take advantage of the technologies we already have, admitting that no automatic translation will ever live up to the capacity of a literary <laughs> translator, and no, they won't, and let's not open this stupid pocket of, of arguments. It's, it's just not the same. Literary translation is not a mechanical thing. But these softwares can serve as useful augmentative tools for readers who develop a secondary competence for critical use of such tools. In Hungarian, it's called pod competencia. So basically, it's like um, a substitute competence for language that you don't speak, but you are trying to make sense of. That is with an understanding that the translation they read will inevitably be fragmented and faulty, but some meaning will be possible to extract. And given that the former lingua franca, Latin, the former biggest lingua franca, developed into these many languages which hold these very similar traits, there's also mm -hmm. quite a, a range of expressions that they will be able to confess. So, um, I think, I, I think we, I'm just looking at the time and we, yeah. uh, um, can we come to yeah. like a final? Yeah. So just the end sentence is, is around the corner. The only thing I still want to make uh, after this long tirade is that the kind of curiosity for each other, each other's languages and, in, and each other's affairs, even if they don't obviously directly um, affect our lives, is something that we have to develop by education. And I think this has to be an educative process that media also take part in. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You touched upon some really, really important uh, uh, points. Uh, and I wanted to proceed directly with Calypso. What was your reaction to both um, uh, Reka and uh, Francesca's statement? And then we will wrap up this discussion uh, and go to the second minute of today. Thank you, Anne-Marie and, and everybody. Um, you know, listening to, don't you find it interesting that this is the session out of our three where we all start, more, most of us, with a kind of linguistic mini bio, you know, if, as if 
this is in a way the language the closest to how we say who am i guys um and in fact with the flip side of this which is that this group of course is not representative everybody has some sort of multilingual background ideal etc um and uh, so that would be my first remark about self-reflectiveness as a group um and and i heard it you know before um and this is as someone who you know struggled with english for the, when i had to learn it in my 20s um going to the us and still not happy you know rick i'm like you you know oh god i have my american accent and i'm not american and it's, what do you do with these accents of accents and the, the second also remark in reacting uh to um, uh, initially to francesca's um presentation, fascinating presentation on linguistic nationalism and this kind of bullying going on, happening like the Russian dolls, you know, you already said, you know, go from oppressed to oppressing. So you remember in Southeast Europe, we, in the Balkans, we have this joke, you know, which is the guy who says, hey, why would I be a minority in your country when you can be a minority in my country? Um, and indeed, uh, that's <laughs> the old joke, right? And um, um, I mean, I think we're always back to, hey, the rule of law. So in all of these problems, let's remember, there is a savior, the rule of law. Now, I just let me make two really quick, three quick points. One is this, um, what we're all talking about, the connection between the lingua franca, everyone agrees we need one in Europe, English, and, and the local. And of course, there's a wonderful book we haven't really mentioned yet, it's Philip Van Parish, my dear friend, huh? linguistic justice from Europe, for Europe and the world. And of course, he argues, and I think that's what I'm hearing from everyone, we need more of both, more lingua franca, uh, including, as Rekha was just saying, through technologies, but basically English. But yet, that is like, a, it's not like a pendulum. It, it's two forces at the very same time. If you're going to have more lingua franca, you have to support local or national languages, um, as we said. Um, and you know when Mathieu was talking about the centrifugal forces, um, I think the EU, uh, and I want to emphasize what the EU has to do, is to understand that Euro skepticism is grounded on uh, on existential fears. It's not so much about what the EU does, but what, or it, it's what it does to us. How we can shrink and disappear. There's demographic fear. There's linguistic fear um, and somehow I don't find that sensitivity in Brussels I don't think and I'd love to hear how you all think let's throw money at it but you know be, first of all there's not enough money as Francesca was saying but the, it's a mindset and talking about Brussels mindset um, in this combination between lingua franca and, and national and local um, I don't know if you remember, but before Brexit, I know Orlando doesn't even want to re remember before Brexit, but we were um, having this joke, you know, that everyone in the council, all the national representatives, should speak their second language, should not speak their first language, which of course the very funny uh, impact that only the Brits would not speak English. Um, now, I think that now that we, <laughs> that the Brits are out, um, in a way, in a very paradoxical, ironic way, it, it makes English lingua franca less sensitive because you, you won't have these Brits with their wonderful British accent, which, you know, linguistic arrogance and all the rest of it and impresses everyone. So that kind of resolves a problem, although, you know, you might want to say, well, you all have to speak your third language. But that, that as it may, my second point that I really wanted to make to echo in echo around everybody's praising for the second and third language at school um, with caveats, but let's, let's agree just for a moment that we believe this is important for all the reasons that Francesca said. Um, I just want to put on the table here, you know, my own experience with the European school. Uh, because, um, and some of you may have had kids in European schools, but I, I happen to have the luck of having uh, a daughter who was in the one and only European school in Britain at Cullum near Oxford, um, to say two things. One is that there is huge amount to learn from the 14 European schools that exist. Um, and there, 
and in the balance between the main language and the second language where you learn history and geography. That is, you don't learn your second language. You don't learn the language. You learn something about the world in that second language. And all the thinking that has gone with that. And I, for years I have been preaching for type two European school where it's not the same, I'm not gonna get into technical details, but we should have hundreds and hundreds of European type school mm -hmm. with all the, and the European back and everything it means for language. Um, and um, you know, we don't have time, but this is a very important dossier. And, and there's been PhD thesis about this, by the way, if anyone is yeah. interested. Um, and the sad footnote to this is of course that when Brexit happened, and you had this one and only European school with, I, I agree, Francesca, with very existentialist courageous kids because they were in this island in Britain. There was a huge struggle as to whether that school could become a kind of affiliated and still be able to give the European back and follow that whole wonderful you know, approach, which we can criticize, but nevertheless. All the other European schools were in favor, but the Ayatollah of EU law, Ayatollahs in Brussels, I'm sorry to say, you know, refused it. And um, this is, you know, back to yesterday's conversation. Let's have tough love vis-a-vis with 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 the EU. It was a really, really sad story because you have to be European state. But in, in international law, you can grandfather rights and they refused to do it. And they punished the, the kids who were the most existentially courageous in Europe. And that's, I think that's a story that still needs to be covered because it's really sad about what the, the lack of vision that the EU has. And my third and final point um, has to do with the bigger kind of what everybody talked about. We can call the EU, yes, a community of translation um, in, in the many different ways in which we understand translation. That's from the discussion we just had. And it is that, that kind of community that should be part of what we mean by education for a kind of humanist European citizenship in our schools. Um, and, and, you know, you've given Francesca and others lots of, you know, examples uh, about what should be subsidized and all of this. Absolutely. I would, you know, on Erasmus, completely agree with the critical take. Um, both because, of course, this is a small percentage of 1%, a small fraction of 1%, 3 million over 23 years. Um, so it should be radically extended to all sorts of other groups. Um, but also how you do it. You know, I've had lots of Erasmus students. They have no obligation to, you know, write something about the local country where they are, to write an essay, to contribute to some website where mm -hmm. there would be exchanges. And then other ideas, you know, what about an Erasmus for tourists? Because if there is mobility in the EU, there's a lot of tourists, you know, how could we piggyback on this kind of like, you know, sometimes mindless tourism or a little tour or whatever, and add a kind of almost political flavor to that, but yeah. lots of things to do there. But what I want to conclude is I'm just putting back on the table three concepts that should, you know, inspire our thinking. One is to, you know, I, when Alicia was talking about people afraid of multilinguals, yes, because in a way you are a Trojan horse and you are what, you know, good, good heart calls, you know, the, the any, people from anywhere instead of somewhere. And what, when we need to speak about cosmopolitanism and cosmopolitan education in Europe, this is not about being from nowhere. It's about being from several somewheres, but really belonging to these somewheres. How do you develop that idea? Of, and I think that's the original idea of cosmopolitanism. Secondly, when Livia talks about national myth, yes. Um, and how do we have, the, if the EU is also a community of others, each misunderstanding the myth of other countries and their language in a very bigger sense, how do you engineer mutual recognition uh, through those prejudices? And my third word, of course, is picking up on the conversation we had about empathy. And that's where I put in the chat, you know, the, the book from, that Matthew and Yuri um, uh, edited uh, four years ago on, on, on picking up on Isaiah Berlin, which is a lot in a way about empathy. Um, to think about, you know, how, how do you go beyond just merely saying, well, try to understand others and the wishy-washy idea of, of empathy to a much deeper idea of empathy, where, um, where indeed this is about really putting yourself in, in the other's shoes 
with cognitively as well as effectively and and thinking about how do you translate this through institutions, through yeah. norms, um, and getting all European citizens. So at the end of the day, for me, this question of language is a political question, and we come back all the way to yeah. democracy. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Calypso. I think this is a wonderful wrap up uh, for this part of the discussion. Um, I was asked and actually urged also to include a very, very short break. Um, so I wanted to, uh, uh, to, to uh, do a break for five minutes um, and we'll see each other back at 11 to speak about um, the fourth and final myth of today uh, presented by Mathieu Seger. So uh, see you back in a bit. Okay. Same. Hello, hello. Welcome back. I hope you uh, enjoyed your coffee and uh, we'll start with the second part of, uh, of the discussion. Um, and thank you so much for all your interesting points uh, during the first uh, two, one and a half hour. I think it was a great uh, discussion. Uh, and now I wanted to start with Mathieu, who prepared uh, the, the last myth of today. Uh, yes. Um, I I would like to try to keep it as brief as possible because I think we have uh, a, a lot to say, to say to each other still and I'm, I'm also very curious to hear the others. Uh, I think I can uh, thank you Calypso for the summary just before the break because I can build on that um, and you already summarized the main points also yeah, re relating to the myth that I want to scrutinize here and that is the myth of uh, finalité politique but i think that is, was also already clear from yesterday um, if there is one key risk for european integration the europe of european integration we are living in uh, it is um, the yeah the longing for a blueprint uh, i think that is uh, maybe uh, very crudely summarized what i meant what i meant here uh, so the the, the nature of the Europe of European integration should not be that blueprint or that finalité politique or that end goal. Uh, it should only be a means uh, to an end to, uh, to connect to what um, Geraldine said yesterday. Uh, and I think that is very key. But that means that the Europe we are living in is only a temporary fix uh, and a temporary fix with a lot of weaknesses, actually. Um, on the other hand, it's in the temporality, and that was also something that we touched upon yesterday, also in relation to Jan Patochka, and I will come back to that briefly later. Um, in the temporality is also the strength of the, the European culture, so to say. Um, the, ad, the adaptation to constantly changing circumstances while keeping upright or trying to keep upright certain principles and institutions and let these institutions change with uh, these circumstances so as to uh, enable them to survive. Um, put in another way, the only credible way to make this claim to human rights, uh, human dignity, to make that real in day-to-day -day life uh, is in this temporality. To uh, prove that you are serious about this, for instance, in, re in relation to the situation of Moria, Lesbos, to, to, to give one of the examples of today. I think that is key. And it's key to, uh, to, to, to stress that in this, in this temporality, yes, that is, that is a certain weakness when you compare it to more elegant narratives and stories that are black and white about utopias and nation states and stuff like that. These, that's also something that we touched about, uh, upon yesterday, that this, this, this elegance of nationalistic rhetoric, for instance, uh, is in the black and white, is in the blueprints, is in the, the uh, ready-made solutions for complex problems, which are in the end false uh, promises. Uh, so the temporality is, is, should be the strength of Europe, European culture and the Europe of European integration, although it's very difficult to market, so to say, because it's uh, so full of nuance. Um, then another point that I want to make in the, um, uh, on the basis of the text that I uh, handed in and uh, as that these are my two cents and nothing more than that, um, is that um, this strength should be um, uh, found, I think, uh, in, in Europe's history. 
Uh, and in that, I, I very much relate to, without uh, trying to repeat what was said yesterday, to what Reka said yesterday about history, uh, but also today, actually, in the context of this uh, discuss discussion on language. Uh, but also Geraldine uh, stressed that point yesterday. H history should be the source uh, of strength, but that history is also a history uh, of darkness. It's not only a history of enlightenment, as we all know, of course. And, just to, to, to underline that point, I want to quote George Steiner's magnificent essay, uh, The Idea of Europe, um, where he says, um, in the 1930s, the Germans wanted to be German, the Italians want to be, wanted to be Italian, and so forth. Only the Jews aspired to be European. It took the Holocaust for the nations of Europe to realize the virtues of this common identity. Um, and then he makes the point that as Europe lurches back towards nationalism and so forth, it's important to reassess this legacy. I think that is really, really very important, uh, to put it maybe somewhat more poetically, um, or to quote um, uh, Benedetto Croce, for instance, uh, you have to go back to uh, the Reich their mother, so to say, uh, the, 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 the realm of the mothers, uh, as, as it is called in, in, in Goethe's Faust, uh, to really understand where you're coming from. So that history, the reassessment of our own history is essential and is done in a very easygoing way at the moment. And in this, I fully agree with what Calypso said a couple of times today. You know, the, the, the Europe of Brussels, is a very bad example, a very bad example. They are working with blueprints most of the time, and they are very easygoing about the history uh, of Europe, uh, only um, uh, taking from that history in a very imp imp impressionistic way what, uh, uh, what is useful for their, for their, for their uh, marketing story, let's put it like that. Uh, so there's a lot to worry there. And then a, a last point on the basis of the text. Um, in essence, European history in, in many ways is, uh, especially contemporary history or modern European history, is a history of decline. And I think this is also a very important notion to bear in mind when we talk about, for instance, all these fears that we have, the uncertainty that we sense amongst the peoples of Europe. The discussion about language that we have is very much about uncertainty, fear, and a, a feeling that we are at the, in the defense um, in a world that is no longer controlled by Europe, European culture or whatever. Um, and this, this um, uh, characteristic of, of contemporary European history, this, that this decline also says something about everything that we come up with in terms of institutions and corporations, for instance, in the Europe of European integration. I believe that many of these things that we put and piece together, how beautiful they may be in some senses, how good the intentions uh, uh, might be, in essence are uh, artifacts of management of decline. Uh, or as to just to quote somebody to, to make this maybe somewhat more illustrative, um, Charles de Gaulle said always when he was president of France, um, we are in decline. And actually, we are in decline already since 1815, uh, when Napoleon didn't succeed in conquering Moscow. Uh, and I think that is a very telling uh, quote to see uh, in what situation we are in a from a global perspective. You know, we are, as Europeans, in many ways in decline, and that is an underlying force for a lot of feelings and emotions that are feeding into the debate uh, and into the institution, the construction of institutions that we are, uh, that we are part of uh, at the moment in the Europe of European integration. Then some uh, random uh, things that I want to uh, bring in uh, just on the basis of what we discussed uh, in, uh, yesterday and today. Uh, we talked about uh, Jan Patochka, uh, his, his nickname or also known as the Socrates of Prague. 
I think Socrates is also very important um, on a deeper layer uh, in relation to what we were discussing uh, up till now. Socrates said, uh, when, I, when I try to summarize uh, the, his, his main message, uh, a life that cannot be researched is not worth living. You should always ask why, why? That means in practice, when we look to the Europe of today, that we should be seriously interested in alternatives. So the often used argument, for instance, coming from the Europe of Brussels, there is no alternative, is the opposite of this attitude, the Socrates, the Socrates attitude. You always should be open for alternatives. And I agree with Calypso that this is the good news of Brexit. The Brits are, in, in a, from a certain perspective, brave enough, I don't know if they know it themselves, to show or to try to show that there, that there is an alternative. Uh, and we in Europe, we're, we're, we're not, you know, you know, we are too easygoing about this. We were too much in the avenue of there is no alternative to European integration. And it was leading, and it's still leading, to a very unproductive feeling of a straitjacket, of a one-size-fits-all uh, undertaking that nobody fits in the end. And it's also relating to the, to the, to, to the, the points of discussion that we, uh, that we touched upon in the, in the, in the, in the language uh, part, the first part of today. Uh, so I think, you know, indeed, there is some, some, some good news in, in, in Brexit from this more um, uh, general, conceptual, philosophical point, that there is an alternative now, and this also forces the Europe of European integration to redefine itself vis-a-vis -vis this alternative. And there was, you know, this very, uh, very urgent matter uh, anyhow in these times to define Europe vis-a-vis -vis former partners, being it the Brits, being it the, the America of Donald Trump uh, uh, or the Russia of uh, Vladimir Putin. And then a, and a, a very last uh, uh, thought. Um, the brute facts of, of geography, we also touched upon these. And I think um, that is a very, also a very important perspective to look at um, the present and the history uh, of Europe. And for this, I, I quote again from, from the, the, um, the wonderful essay of George Steiner, The Idea of Europe. Uh, at a certain moment, he says, uh, Europe has been and is walked, walked from walking. This is capital. The cartography of Europe arises from the capacities the perceived horizons of human feet. European men and women have walked their maps from hamlet to hamlet, from village to village, from city to city. More often than not, distances are, not a human, are on a human scale. They can be mastered by the traveler, on foot, by the pilgrim to Compostela, by the promeneur, be he solitaire or gregarious. There are stretches of arid forbidden terrain. There are marshes, Alps tower, but none of these constitute a terminal obstacle. Europe has no death valley, no outback intractable, intractable to the traveler. I think this is, this is very, very key. And, he, and then he goes on that integral components of the European thought and sensibility are in the root sense of the word pedestrian. The cadence and sequence, their cadence and sequence are those of the walker. In Greek philosophy and rhetoric, the peripatetics are literally those who travel on foot from polis to polis. And he goes on. Um, I think this is, this is very key because what Steiner, I think, is trying to tell here is that Europe should be about um, micro, local, very uh, much about the nearness of others, families. And in a way, it's in the geography of the continent, a continent that is so dense, 
that is so nuanced when you look at its coastlines, that is so where people are so close to each other and actually tied up to each other uh, through history of families. And to that, you, you, you could also uh, bring the quote of, of Sigmund Freud, all family, it, all history is family history. I think that is very true uh, for European history. Very, very true. And I think, you know, that angle of local scale, um, walked distances, the geography of the continent, but also all the inefficiencies that come with that, the time it takes to go from one place to the other by foot, the time it gives in terms of contemplation and possibilities for reflection. This is all key to you know, what we could call something as the, the core strengths potentially uh, of Europe, European culture and the European example uh, when you compare it to other alternatives. And of course, uh, that is the main message uh, of my statement. We should do that. We should constantly compare to other alternatives within Europe, but also uh, 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 outside Europe. And in this exercise, never fall for the seduction of blueprints, utopias, finalité politiques, uh, or easy solutions for what in essence are always complex problems. So thank you very much, uh, Mathieu, for this um, realistic and also slightly optimistic story. Um, Nicolo, would you like to react to this? Sure, thanks. Um, look, I, I find that the, the, the core part of the story that Mathieu uh, tells is, is very seductive. It's ones that I've been using to try to mobilize citizens these past years, it's, it's the one, or at least a certain group of citizens, it's, it's, the, it's the story of Europe has, has no final form. It's constantly an adventure, as Bauman calls it, or it's an infinite task, as the title of Rudolf Gatschke's book on, on Derrida and Levinas and the others who thought about Europe. It's this constant experimentation. It's unfinishable. This can be very engaging and um, and mobilizing it's the precondition for another europe is possible as as you as, as you almost said um and and so this is a way of energizing people but as with all seductive tools um you have to be a little bit careful who you use them on um, otherwise you can have some some unpleasant experiences and i think that one of the dangers um is with using this kind of discourse with people in positions of political responsibility because uh, the danger is if you say that Europe has no finality, uh, they don't so much hear that there's, they shouldn't have a blueprint. They think that, for example, the goals are movable. Uh, and so there's been this discourse in, in Brussels and elsewhere over recent years that uh, Europe's original story around peace and reconciliation doesn't resonate so much anymore. And so we ought to come up with a different one. Um, which is another way of saying Europe has failed to guarantee peace in its, in, both on its continent and on its borders. So maybe we should tell a different story. Um, and this is obviously a very dangerous uh, way of understanding the idea that Europe doesn't have finality politique. It's not what you were talking about, Matthew, but it's what some people risk hearing. Um, and, uh, and so for that reason, I think it's important to clarify. And in this, I'm very Aristotelian that political communities do have a goal uh, and we can discuss what that goal should be. I mean, Aristotle was talking about well-being and the, um, the uh, flourishing of the citizenry. That seems to me already not a bad goal. Uh, but if you want to take some words from uh, the European story, well, maybe the one I just mentioned, peace uh, and also uh, justice could be um, could be could be good examples, and um, that would mean acknowledging some of the ways that the European Union has failed in living up to some of those things. Also, acknowledging that there can be different visions, different ideas about what peace might mean, and you, we can have a debate about it. You can say, well, peace should be understood only in its uh, international relations sense, or one could say, well, peace also means not battling with the policeman in the streets of Bulgaria or uh, in, in Belarus, or it means not having linguistic violence. Uh, it means not having social violence. Um, so we can have a discussion then about 
different forms of peace and what might be required in the, of the European Union to guarantee uh, the different kinds of, of peace we might want to promote. And then I think if we have this combination of um, some commonly agreed goals uh, and different ideas of how to get there, we have a much richer, I would say, uh, ideological debate about the kind of Europe we want to have. But I think that having the goals in that sense of finality is important to be able to answer the simple question that many citizens might ask about the European Union, to which the politicians in the United Kingdom, notably, were totally incapable of responding, which is, what is the point of this form of cooperation? That's a yeah. way of asking about the finality. So it, yeah. it's a different way than, than, than what you were talking about with finality, but we have to keep it in mind. Um, yeah. I want to finish with one last thing because I, I, I think it's really important. If Europe should have another goal, it has to be for me, and it's, it's been slightly irritating me throughout the morning, I have to say, about changing our geographical representations of what Europe means. Francesca, for example, talked about 60 languages, I think it was, in Europe. Um, now, that's, that's a bigger number than, than the European Union will tell you, but there's more than 60 languages being spoken in the three streets around me in Paris here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a, we need to radically change our idea of what Europe is and who lives here and its connections with the rest of the world. Part of that is also understanding Europe's history in going to often invading the rest of the world. And also a very critical reflection of uh, former countries that were part of the European Union. I mean, you're taking the UK as a test case. What about Algeria uh, as a much earlier test case? Uh, to think through. And I think ultimately this comes down to, last sentence, a different conception of our borders. And that's where I'm not at all sure that the UK example is a good example for uh, the European Union, because it's coming down to an argument around the border where peace was crucial. And I'm not clear at all that the UK, as is conceived by the people who are in charge of the UK, can leave the European Union really uh, while preserving the peace that was um, installed up until now uh, through the Good Friday Agreements. That's a wider yeah. debate, but it's something that was important to me. Thank you. Thank you so much for raising these points, uh, Nicola. Um, I wanted to see if Mathieu wants to react to this, and then I would like to go to Simon. Yeah, very, very briefly, I, 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 I fully agree, um, actually, with, the, with almost everything that uh, Nicola said. Um, Algeria, indeed, is a very interesting case, uh, also from the um, perspective of uh, imperialism and decolonization and the, the relations these processes have, these very intimate relations these processes have to the, pro to the, to the project of European integration. I think that is, that is a, a point well taken and was not uh, something that we addressed uh, as yet, but, but, but very, very key. Uh, and I fully agree, you know, on, on the broader uh, assessment of, of Brexit, you know, I th yeah, this is a dangerous undertaking. But from a conceptual view, it's also helping the Europe of European integration to a certain extent. Thank you so much, uh, Simon. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to touch on the point of representation, because it came throughout the whole morning from time to time, we touched on the point of representation. And I think it's very interesting um, or crucial that maybe in the end we, we face this problem, as Mathieu, um, Nicolo just said, it's the biggest problem or the biggest challenge we have with representation. And I mean, I, I wonder what this could actually mean. Um, I mean, obviously, the the white uh, supremacy of our podium in some sense is, is one point. But the other question is, what does real representation would mean um, for the future of Europe? So when we, and, and especially for the themes we are talking about, you know, when we talk about Europe. So I tend to ask myself, for example, why is there not a broader influence um, or political representation of Muslim communities in the European debate. Wouldn't that be first, first step for having a broader diversity and bigger uh, um, uh, schemes and, and other themes and topics uh, in politics? Because obviously what we haven't talked about at all so far is religion as one of the forces 
first in history of Europe, but now, right now, it's a big force coming back to our society, our secular, liberal uh, European society. And I tend to look at it as a great um, challenge, but also an adventure to having debates about religion with young immigrants, um, Muslim context or other context, who, you know, young people who have religion as a new uh, a theme again on our topic. So um, from time to time, I think that we are stuck in our, you know, debate frames we have from the past and we just reproduce them in some sense, you know. We have our left and right schemes, we have the ideologies, um, we have the, the quotes from our books and stuff. But I mean, 60, 70 percent of Europeans right now uh, are coming from different, you know, mindsets. And um, it would be interesting to, you know, to broaden up these debates. I mean, so, you know, when you, when you look at what the people, if you want to call it like this, really are, um, are looking at is integrating forces, it's obviously sports at one point. I mean, in every, you know, immigration um, a context when you talk to, to teachers and in, in schools or their sport is one of the main, main, main forces to integrate and to bring together people. So, and we tend as intellectuals not to talk about sports because we think oh, it's a bit too far away or something, but why not talk about it more, you know? And even on a broader European level, talk about sports, talk about religion, but really also not on this, ah, oh, Muslim and she's wearing uh, this and is it really, is it really um, helping or is it not helping? But just take it seriously as a theme that a lot of people right now are facing in their day-to-day -day life, you know, and why not mm -hmm. representing these scenes? So I just wanted to say that for me, the question of representing is not just um, a question of who's on a panel or, um, uh, or what, uh, what skin is uh, your color. Obviously, that's important as well, but also representation of themes, you know, of topics yes. uh, in our debate. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, uh, Simon. I think this is a really important uh, point to, you make. And what is maybe interesting to know is that part of the Dishwares Forum and European Culture is also a large European uh, initiative started actually by an 18-year-old uh, Muslim girl who wrote a letter to all Europeans, which was spread throughout all uh, uh, national, um, uh, how do you say it, national representations of the EU. Uh, and there came really reactions from Bulgaria, from Poland, from Italy, from Spain. So actually this is something that is happening uh, uh, and it's a pity that, that she's not included in this session. I think it would be really interesting. Um, but it's nice for you to know, to take a look at this um, uh, Gen Z Manifesto, uh, which is uh, started by Dilara Bilgic. Uh, an 18 year uh, Muslim girl who really wants to take, and she's not even speaking about religion because she just wants to find a common ground uh, with all Europeans. Um, but it's interesting to know that there is something going on and I think we should really stimulate these kind of uh, uh, initiatives. Um, but it, it's indeed a really important point uh, you make, Simon. Um, is there anyone who wants to add something to this point? Uh, Flavia? I'd rather have a question for Mathieu, because um, I found it really interesting to follow, uh, of course, your input, but what role do you see to like the, the leadership or political leadership? So, because, you know, I, on the one hand, of course, theoretically agree on what you say, that after all, we have no option to, but we have to kind of model through, um, you know, the everyday evolution of this European Union, but on the other hand, if you criticize uh, the, the European leadership for working a lot with blueprints, what do you see then as a, I don't know, as a, as a goal, if it shouldn't be a defined finalité politique, mais what could be then kind of the star that we look at or you understand my question? Yes, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yeah, that is, of course, a, a key question. So, um, what I, what I uh, would tend to uh, lean towards is to spontaneous order as much as possible. So, the facilitation of spontaneous order, which is very, very close to liberalism, but which, is all, which also remains very open. Uh, to a certain extent, it's also very close to uh, the FAZ, uh, um, uh, you know, a kind of uh, mission uh, deep down, which is very ordo-liberal. 
which kind of teaches us, and it's also close to the European project, if you look to the treaties, and, and we're really into the treaties, um, it's about two things. It's about a framework that, is, that resembles a rule of law on a pan-European scale, but doesn't replace national rules of laws and, and, and variations amongst them. It's a, it's a framework and not more than that. It adds to national democracies and rule of law systems and not replaces them, very crucial. But because of the framework, it kind of creates a space in which spontaneous order um, uh, harmonized with liberal principles is possible. And that then leads to all kinds of examples because you know the variation is huge. No region is the same, no city is the same, even no quarter in a city is the same as the other quarter. And, that, and there is something of the strength of Europe because what you then get is a kind of, to put it in order liberal terms, institutional competition. So you will see things that work and things that do not work. Things that uh, appeal to, to the public and things that the public rejects. Uh, things that raise discussion and things that go unnoticed and reconcile all kinds of contradictions. And from, the, from that palette of examples, you can learn a lot. It's, it's kind of the COVID uh, management uh, by the European Union, which was very national, but at the same time coordinated from a center, not by, 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 by giving out all kinds of rules and reg, reg, regulations, but by getting, you know, gathering all kinds of examples, uh, learning from these examples and trying to move forward on the basis of that. And I think that is not the same as modeling true. Uh, it's, uh, it's much more about learning. Modeling true kind of is, is, is a term that is in a way uh, uh, a very inept description, I think, of what is going on. You, it, it's, it's in the end about learning from each other and the willingness to do that. But to keep that, 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 that that's to, to create that space where all these examples are possible, and I think that is also a key thing that I want to bring across, uh, you have to have also um, um, an attitude of live and let live. You, you, you uh, postpone judgment. Uh, you have uh, an attitude also of wait and see. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I can learn through all, although I did understand it at the beginning. I will maybe even never understand it. So the live and let live in Europe is, I think, very important because that comes with all kinds of, and, and Simon, thank you for religion, religious religions, respect the other. You know, you don't have to understand him or her but you respect the other, respect that things in other places or with other people go in another way. Uh, and with that come, you know, very Christian or religious notions like forgiveness. And that is why I raised the point. Forgiveness is maybe more important in the Europe of cooperation than integration is. You know, I, I didn't understand what you were doing. You were doing it in a completely other way that I can ever, you know, imagine. But you did it in that way. And I, you know, I accept that. And I, uh, I forgive you <laughs> to a certain extent for that, for, that, for that other way, instead of trying to re-educate people uh, from your, uh, on the basis of your own upbringing and background. So Mathieu, if I'm understanding you right, you also say that sometimes doing nothing or withholding from actions can actually bring Europeans closer together. So be a bit, so be more patient. Yeah, that's, it, it could be one of the strengths. So one, one very small anecdote. I was in The Hague uh, at the high point of the Euro crisis for a closed session with a high advisor of the Chinese government on foreign affairs. And um, he was there and he, he made his introductionary remarks and he said, uh, I want to know how you up till now have handled the Euro crisis. I'm deeply impressed. And everybody there thought that he was making a joke. But then everybody looked at each other, a, a, a Chinese high officer on foreign affairs making jokes, that is impossible. And it, it wasn't a joke after all, because what he said was, you know, we are, we Chinese 
we are planning on longer terms than a couple of years. We are looking, you know, to 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 centuries or even millennia when we plan our politics. What we see now happening in the financial and economic crisis is a very um, a can-do kind of attitude in the Anglo-Saxon world. People bu buying up uh, states, buying up complete. Uh, sectors, uh, for instance, in a capitalist economy, as the, as the U.S. Was, was doing at that moment. We don't believe in this. We don't believe in this uh, spellbound by the, by the present. Uh, that will only lead to disasters in the future because you don't know what you are doing in the midst of a crisis. What we uh, really um, uh, um, value and what we are impressed by in Europe is that there are non-decisions. There is a series of non-decisions on how to handle the crisis. And we think that is a strength of your institutional model. And everybody in the room was kind of struck by this statement because it was a complete shift of perspective. So we were accused in international media in Europe from doing too little too late. And then this, Chi this Chinese came, came along and he said in his, in his confidential session, you know, this is exactly what we want to know. How, how do you organize this? How do you organize non-decisions at the height of a crisis? You know, and that was, that was fascinating. And that, that got me thinking, you know, this, there is also a strength here. Indeed, as you say, on the Marijn, in wait, there, is a, there can be a strength in wait and see. There can be a strength in, in not taking decisions. You know, and that is, that is, that is a fascinating viewpoint uh, for me, although I do not know exactly what we should do with it, but, you know, it's just a side. We have Flavia and then Calypso. Just a quick reaction. Thank you, Mathieu. My point is really just, I also am fascinated by this on the one hand, but it also needs to be understood by the people and by the broad public. And I think that's a problem we're facing these days that actually in times of uncertainty, people want leadership in one way or the other. And if they don't see this kind of happening, um, and I think that's, yeah, that's critical. But on the other hand, maybe just to build up on your point, and maybe as a question to us as a group, how could we um, enable um, us, the, the, you know, the public to bring back these uh, values of empathy or respect that you mentioned, and also Simon, Simon came up uh, with tolerance and so on. How can we bring this back to the political arena as well. And just from my background, I specifically th think about the political arena because I think after all, um, they, that's really mediated, uh, of course, um, sphere. And if we could make sure that these values um, get back in again, and that it's also seen as something considered as something valuable, um, because people realize that we're all in this boat together and that we have kind of a trial and error component every time. Um, but that would be maybe my question to ask, how can we bring back in? Yeah. Calypso, Calypso, can you maybe also react to this, this, this point that Flavia asks about how are, we going, how are we going to convey this to the audience? How are we going to explain that sometimes not taking action might be a good thing? Right. <laughs> if only I had the solution. Um, because indeed, yeah. the fascinating conversation, you know, is all about tension. And also, I think Mathieu, you know, for me, was saying most profound things and important thing about spontaneous order, which is not anarchy. Um, and of course, philosophers have thought about this, you know, forever. <laughs> They're not politicians. And Niccolo was also super right to say, well, okay, but that's different from having actually a goal. And I actually know that Niccolo agrees with Matthew, and he, he said it himself. Um, so it's exactly the, 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 the challenge that Niccolo was giving us, his fabulous challenge, you know, because at the end of the day, people ask what in Europe all the time, fine, diversity and all this, uh, even spontaneity, but what is the glue that holds us together as a polity? And to me, I mean, if I can just put some seeds in the conversation, you know, one is very simple. It's togetherness. You know, it's the, it's the Steiner quote. It's so amazing and beautiful that Mathieu read. You know, <laughs> we're stuck together and, and very close to each other. 
Um, and you know, Mathieu, I don't know if you know this great um, book by uh, Nancy Rosenblum on neighborhood, with, when you were talking about live and let live. Um, she wrote a book on the democracy of everyday life, looking at how we relate to our neighbors uh, as the democracy of everyday life. Um, and, and that's, and her biggest point is the way neighborhoods work is exactly through this live and let live idea. So one question about the kind of scaling we've been discussing about is how can we learn from togetherness in one space for togetherness in another space? and starting with neighborhood, which was of course very important in the COVID story. But then, you know, one of the lessons there, Mathieu, is that, and it's kind of a question to you, is that um, politically, and especially in the EU, where we have to do big things together, you know, what M Michael Sandel wrote beautifully on neutral tolerance, but then there is a gradation between neutral tolerance, engagement, recognition and you know at the end of the day integration and diversity it's it's a spectrum and we need to be in different places in the spectrum for different things and that's also complicated but now to flavia's question then you know i'd, I'd pick two two themes here one is you know peace and nicola's you know brilliant you know uh, a reminder that peace is everywhere i mean let's not dis peace and let's resist Sorry, Nicola, I'm, trying, I'm, you know, I'm rewording what you said um, um, uh, in a different way. But, you know, I, I hate this discourse that, oh, yeah, we're beyond peace. Uh, there's multifaceted uh, dimension of peace. And if need be, okay, let's use the bad word, war. You know, in, 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 we talk about non-ideal theory and philosophy that is sometimes you, you want to talk about the anti-values, not the values. What, that, what we want to escape. Europeans wanted to escape war. We still want to escape war. And, that, and what behind war is often the will to subordinate somebody else, to dominate somebody else. And by the way, don't we see this in Europe all the time, between big and small countries, between different types. But of course, we've seen it in our history globally, and we see it again globally. And perhaps that is our raison d'etre, you know, internally and externally, is to make sure that we have institutions that guard against the will to subordinate. That leads to war, because that's always the end product. And the second and last thing um, there is that we, we were talking, I love the Chinese story, Mathieu, and it's about time, you know, my big theme these days is to try to see if Europe can pivot from the politics of space to a politics of time. You know, acknowledging that, you know, European citizens used to love their uh, hope for the future while fearing for the past. And now it's the inverse. And we need to reinvent a Europe that is really long term future friendly. And I think our Chinese guy was well aware that the, they may have the strength of a, of a planning government that can do coercive planning. But if the long-term future is not earned by citizens, it doesn't work. And my friends at Oxford who do China, you know, tell me, Chinese people, they don't invest in, the, in, they don't invest in stocks. They don't, their behavior is super short-term, you know, in day-to-day -day <laughs> behavior. So I think the Euro, so it's a kind of false idea that China is very long-termist. Actually, Europe has the potential. I'm doing, I don't think it's doing it well yet, but to be the example of sustainability, not just climate change, obviously climate change, but for everything, thinking about future generations. That's a very, very mobilizing you know, um, theme. And very often, Mathieu, I agree, it means non-decisions. It means not, you know, um, not doing stuff that will um, somehow capture the future. Yeah. Let the future generation take some decisions. That's a mindset. So that would be my two, you know, peace and war and yeah. long term today, urgency of the long term. Yeah, thank you so much, Calypso. Uh, Alicia, I saw you raising your hand in the middle of Calypso's uh, speech, and then we go to Rika. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for contributing. Um, I think I, I, I will try to, to bring Flavia's question that she asked, we need leadership, um, or the people need. I think we all need leadership. I want leaders. Um, if I want to believe in the European Union, if I want to believe in the future for my children, then I want good leaders. And how do you combine that with 
uh, things that Matthew has raised, uh, such as the examined life of uh, Socrates, and also asking constant new questions, and sometimes maybe postpone giving an answer. Um, and I think the, the crucial questions we can ask ourselves, or should ask ourselves, what is a good leader? And I think a good leader is someone who um, has a, um, takes, takes actions actually, but taking an action doesn't mean you're constantly doing something. You can take an action by saying, I postpone, or I wait, or I don't know, or I think a good leader, and this is a big problem I see now, and this is why we have uh, populism is so popular is because people think that leaders are the ones that, you know, bang on with the fist and they know the answers and the answers are always easy and they have the solutions. We actually don't like leaders that say, wait a second, I don't know, um, that are humble and, and admit that they do not know the right answer, that they don't know what the best is, but that they will try to do their best and that wanting the best is actually what you want from your leaders, not that they, you know, make promises that they cannot keep. Um, and so I think actually um, thinking about leadership um, is something we should do more often. Um, and in, especially in a time when we really have a lot of um, leaders that are small or big dictators around the world and even in Europe. But if you look close to the leaders that tend to be populists, um, they always know the answer to all the question. There is no humble uh, vein in them. So I, I think that if we want to protect ourselves from a Europe um, that is led by maniacs um, and tend to go to the illiberal side of politics and, and make crumble democ democracy, then we need to, to embrace leaders that have that humble attitude and want to raise questions and ask constantly new questions because that's the examined life that Socrates is about. It's constantly asking new questions. And if you take an action, you have to ask yourself, for whom am I taking this action? What does it lead us to? And always be um, future orientated. I think this is another thing that we are lacking today, that we are orientated on the now, on the new vo voters, on pleasing the mob now and everybody around. But we should be thinking about what about the planet in 50 years, in 100 years? Um, I think we can learn from the Chinese as much as the Chinese can learn from us. We can also learn from them. Um, and so, yeah, I think this brings the two things together, um, re-appreciating real leadership. And for me, le real leadership has always that so uh, the, this, this uh, Socratic vein that we constantly dare to ask questions because that's how we examine things. That's the examined life. Yeah, thank you so much, Alicia, also for bringing this point about humble leadership into uh, this discussion and uh, also our longer term uh, perspectives. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I wanted to give the final word to Mathieu to respond to everything that has been said and then see if there is still anyone. Oh, Reka, Reka is first and then Mathieu, sorry. <laughs> well, I, I gladly give my minutes to Reka because I'm very curious okay. of what she, uh, what she has to say. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I'll try to be shorter than usual this time. I want to <laughs> pick up on uh, Alicia's point and basically was lingering all around talking about leadership and basically, you know, humble leaders don't just uh, ferment out of air in fortunate situations. Humble leaders are formed both by opportunity to socialize people in this way and by institutions which, which only allow for this. And by institutions, I both mean the political institutions of whatever type of institutions they are working at. You know, I don't know, public school headmasters, we're also talking about, it's a very important role. Leadership of all kinds. Um, and also um, a, a public sphere that doesn't, uh, doesn't incentivize um, other types of leadership, that doesn't uh, allow for mere spectacle just for the sake of spectacle. And I know this is an overused example, but I can't help 
but think about Jacinda Erdern, who has her own set of problems, obviously. But I guess you all saw that, that press conference early on in the days of lockdown, when she very clearly and emotionally, but like in a, in a very thought through way, told the children of New Zealand that the Easter Bunny may not make it to them on time which was such a very delicate and thoughtful, but very, very precise way of putting that we are in a deep crisis and you will feel it. We are not going to tell you that you are going to be entirely sheltered from it. We do appreciate your concerns. Basically, we are containing your concerns. We're paying attention. And even when we cannot do anything about this at this point, or even if I can't help it right now, it is important, and I'm keeping this in mind. And that's the kind of containment, and of course, I'm always extrapolating from individual psychology or the, the individual experiences of, of fear or trauma or feeling in control or feeling taken care of. I don't feel taken care of when people bluntly de take decisions for me and tell me what to do. I feel um, cared for when I have a built up trust with people and I can rely on them making good decisions for me, but, but, they, but it is assured that should they try to abuse it, I could quit the situation. So back again, we're basically um, at, at this matter of, of a union by choice. And, um, or for me, at least it pours down to this. And sincerely, there's just better ways to communicate a crisis or better ways to communicate non-decision too. Non-decision is a very strong tool of European diplomacy because European di diplomacy is distilled in the centuries of experience and a modus operandi that is built on this. However, uh, and it's very visible when newcomers uh, enter the stage and don't know these kinds of rules of game, right? Um, there's a lot of problems with this and it has its own advantages, but it is extremely hard to communicate to the masses who very rightfully feel that, that they are being left alone with their troubles. So the kind of more human tone or more humane tone, I think is the first step yeah. to approach this. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Reka. And I wanted to thank you all because um, uh, for today we have to wrap up. Um, we spoke about many, many uh, interesting and important ingredients for a new new idea of what binds Europeans together and what should be done in order to 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 um, uh, to make Europe work better. Actually, um, we spoke about leadership, about the strength of non-decisions. We spoke about um, a multilingual uh, a multilingual Europe and uh, the importance of translation of understanding each other. Um, and I think we touch upon many, many other really important issues. Um, there are also some points that are not being discussed today uh, that are really interesting. So I want to do my best to include that also in the next sessions we will be organizing in Palermo uh, and uh, after that in Warsaw as well. So I think we should speak more about the issue of a class war and what to do about it and what our responsibility is in this um, uh, about the concept of being a European by choice and not by obligation. I think that is a really interesting point. Uh, and lastly, also maybe about uh, the role of the media. So I think these are some points that, 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 that we could speak more about also in the next session. Um, we will let you know uh, very quickly about the next steps. We will uh, write a concept of a paper uh, after this session. And we'll share it to you and we will also keep you posted on the organization of uh, the second session in uh, Palermo. Um, for now, I want to thank all of you for your wonderful contributions, for your time and for your inspirational thoughts. Um, uh, and uh, we keep in contact. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for organizing thank this. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank <laughs> yeah. you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Marijn. <laughs> thank you. See you in a bit. <laughs> and thank you for your moderation, Anne Marijn. Thank you, Francesca. Thanks for your contribution. <laughs>